Here we are in part three of our lecture on uh, metabolism. And next week we're really going to get into the specifics inside of a cell, exactly how it is that ATP are manufactured, exactly how it is that glucose molecules are broken down so that energy from glucose can be utilized to make ATP. This week is really more about giving you all the background information necessary so that we can launch into that discussion next week and you have a clear sense of what's happening. So in this part, part three, we're going to be talking more about enzymes, some of which will be review for you based on um, experiments we've already done in class, and some of it will be new. So um, first things first, you remember that metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions which occur inside the cell. Some of those reactions are um, used to build larger molecules. We call those anabolic reactions like um, anabolic steroids help you um, uh, build muscle. Uh, anabolic metabolism is, are those chemical reactions that allow you to create larger molecules. By comparison, when you break down molecules into smaller parts, that's called a catabolic reaction. So for example, every day when you go to have lunch, uh, once that food enters your stomach, hydrolysis breaks apart those large polymers into smaller monomers. That's an example of catabolic reactions. Anytime I break larger things into smaller things, that's catabolism. Now, very frequently, the process by which we perform either anabolic or catabolic reactions uh, isn't the result of a single step. Usually, there's multiple steps involved, and those multiple steps involve multiple enzymes. So maybe I start out with um, a, prod, uh, a substrate A, and enzyme number one acts on substrate A and converts it into substrate B, and then enzyme number two re reacts on B to create C, uh, oops, C, and then enzyme number three convert C to D, and D maybe is the final product that we were really after. Um, anytime I have a sequence of steps like I just showed you right there, that's called a metabolic pathway. Now you can um, actually predict what will happen in a metabolic pathway. Uh, let's say somebody has a genetic defect and they cannot make enzyme number two here. What do you think will happen to this metabolic pathway? Well, obviously, we're never going to get to be able to create D because we lack enzyme number two. But what's interesting to note is that if we keep adding more and more A to this reaction, you'll notice that we'll start to get a buildup of B because I can't get past B because I'm missing enzyme number two to convert it to C to convert it to D. Now, uh, as you notice from this description here of this metabolic pathway, this, this series of linked reactions, if you will, these are all catalyzed by enzymes. And you will remember enzymes are a subgroup of proteins. They are a special type of protein that performs work. Enzymes work by lowering the energy of activation. And what that means is, imagine if you will, over here in this um, graph, that you have um, some reactants here and you want to make this product over here, okay? Um, those reactants, if we allowed them to, to spontaneously bump into each other and hopefully create the product, like let's say you had a bunch of hydrogen, a bunch of oxygen, a bunch of carbon, uh, and your hope is to make a molecule of sugar. And if you just relied on the kinetic energy of all of those atoms vibrating around and bumping into each other in order to finally bump into each other in the right configuration to make a molecule of, of, of uh, glucose, that would take a lot of energy and a lot of the exact right kind of energy, the right kind of bumping of molecules together at exactly the right moment to make your glucose. Very unlikely to happen. That m amount of energy that is required to get those molecules to interact with each other in order to form the product is called the energy of activation. Okay, energy of activation. And it's very high. All enzymes do is lower the amount of energy it takes to make the different reactants come together to make the final product. 
Okay, so instead of having to require this much energy in order to make sugar, I only need this much energy, which is much less. Okay, by having an enzyme help chaperone or um, uh, interact with the carbons, the oxygens, and the hydrogens to make that molecule of sugar. So enzymes act upon substrates. Substrates are the things that they are going to transform into some sort of products. And remember that uh, enzymes always end, the names of enzymes always end in ASE. So let's take uh, a look here a little more closely at enzymes and how it is that they do what they do. Um, enzymes perform their work on substrates to make products. So if you imagine here is an enzyme. That enzyme has a, um, a very globular shape to it as you can see here and that globular shape um, is what lends to it a certain ability to perform um, action on a particularly shaped substrate. The shape of an enzyme directly influences how it behaves and acts. And in this case, this enzyme is shaped such that there is a little active binding site here that will precisely fit or close to precisely fit a substrate molecule of a particular shape. Okay. Other substrates that are molecules that have a different shape to them will not fit into that active binding site. Um, once that molecule goes into that active binding site, something interesting occurs, and that is that the enzyme will slightly change shape to better hug or attach to that substrate molecule. This is called induced fit. Okay, so the substrate goes into the active binding site and then the actual um, act of entering into that active binding site will cause the enzyme to sort of uh, lock in around that, and that uh, substrate, if you will. That's called induced fit. Um, a rule of thumb to always remember, really critical to remember about proteins and especially the subgroup of proteins called enzymes, is that anytime a molecule attaches to or detaches from an enzyme, that enzyme will change shape. Really critical. Anytime you attach something to an enzyme or you detach something from the enzyme, the enzyme will change shape. So let's take an example here. Here's a reaction where we have an enzyme. You can see its active binding site. Here's the substrate. It, it uh, goes into the active binding site. The enzyme changes shape slightly and in the process of doing that it also performs work on that substrate such that in this case we take the substrate and break it down into two smaller products. Notice when we're done, as soon as those two products detach from the enzyme. The enzyme changes shape again. It goes back to its original shape and now it's ready to go to perform that same action, that same reaction again on a new uh, substrate molecule. So here's another critical piece about enzymes. By catalyzing reactions they are able to lower the energy of act activation so the reaction can occur and more importantly once the reaction is completed they are ready to perf perform the same reaction again and again and again. So they are not themselves consumed by the reaction but rather just assist in the reaction occurring. Here's an example where we're actually making something. Here we take two individual substrates. Those two substrates go into the active binding site. Uh, the uh, enzyme folds kind of around those substrates. Remember, anytime I attach something to or detach it from an enzyme, the enzyme changes shape. And now the enzyme will assist in creating a product where we take those two individual subunits and bring them together. To review here, that's because uh, I'm creating something, that's an anabolic reaction. Over here where I was breaking something down, that was a catabolic reaction. Okay, now we're going to race through a couple of these slides. These are easy because they involve some um, things that you probably already know based on labs we've done in class. you will remember from class that if we add more substrate 
we can increase the rate of reaction, right? If there are more substrate molecules in a, in a beaker, then there's more chances for that substrate to bump into an enzyme molecule and for the reaction to occur. Now what's interesting about this is that there's an upper limit to this. Um, if I keep adding substrate, the rate of reaction over here on the y-axis will continue to increase. But at some point, it will level off. And the reason is out here in this area, I have literally saturated all of the enzymes with as much substrate as I possibly can. There's no way to make the more reactions occur because all the enzyme molecules are currently occupied with substrate. What else can affect enzyme speed? Well, temperature sure can. We know that typically speaking, lower temperatures mean you have lower energy of uh, lower number of reactions occurring. Higher temperature means you have more reactions occurring because the molecules are vibrating more quickly and they're more likely to bump into an enzyme molecule. However, there's an upper limit to this. Notice there's a point where things uh, stop. If the temperature gets too high in a beaker, for example, what will happen is the enzymes will begin to denature. They will unfold. They will lose their specific shape. And once that happens, they no longer are shaped correctly to perform the particular reaction that we're looking at. And you'll notice as a result of that that, boy, the whole uh, rate of number of reactants being created drops way off. Uh, another thing that can affect enzyme speed is pH. Now pH um, is highly dependent on the molecule. Some molecule, or some enzymes, I'm sorry, work really well in a very acidic environment and, and do not perform at all in a neutral environment. Think of the enzymes present in your stomach and small intestines that are doing the acti activities of digestion. Um, those enzymes have to be able to tolerate a very acidic environment in order to function. By comparison, other enzymes work well in a neutral environment but don't work well in a very acidic environment. Here's two examples. Pepsin is an enzyme that is found in your stomach. Notice that it works at low pHs, very acidic environments, but that it has no level of activity up in the neutral range. By comparison, trypsin is another enzyme we actually find in the small intestine. The small intestine uh, has a more alkaline, neutral to alkaline environment, and you will notice that trypsin there uh, works in the 7 to 9 pH range best. So don't assume one pH is the right pH for all enzymes. Now, what about concentration of the enzyme? We've already talked about substrate concentration, but enzyme concentration can also inf impact the rate of reaction. The more enzymes I have around, the more of them can perform work. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about something called cofactors and, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, I won't. I'll talk about them now. I forgot I moved that off that slide. Um, enzyme concentration and enzyme activity can also be impacted by things called cofactors and coenzymes. Now what are these? Cofactors and coenzymes uh, in a nutshell are simply different types of molecules that attach to an enzyme and help it to perform activities. In other words, a lot of times it actually means that the enzyme becomes an active enzyme as opposed to an inactive enzyme. Now enzyme cofactors, okay, the first one on the list there that we're going to talk about, Enzyme cofactors are normally inorganic molecules or they can be a non-protein organic molecule. Uh, they're often ions, for examples, that attach to an enzyme and allow it to function. By comparison, um, coenzymes are non-protein organic molecules. So if like let's say an enzyme needs a lipid to attach to it, a sugar group to attach to it, a nucleotide to attach to it in order to work, that would be called a coenzyme. Sometimes vitamins can function as cofactors. In fact a lot of times vitamins function as um, uh, uh, cofactors and vitamins oftentimes are necessary to make a coenzyme that will uh, then impact enzyme activity. Last thing, 
phosphorylation can, can actu actually impact enzyme activity. And what this means is by simply adding a phosphate group onto an enzyme, you can either activate it or deactivate it. More commonly, you're probably going to activate it. For example, here's an inactive protein. And notice by just putting on a couple phosphate groups onto that protein using an enzyme called kinase, we are able to activate that protein so it can perform work. Last up um, is something else we're going to talk about that you probably haven't heard about before called enzyme inhibition. Enzyme inhibition is when I do something to an enzyme to make it unable to perform its reaction. And um, the easiest way to do something to an enzyme that makes it unable to perform its action is to attach something to it or detach something from it. In this case, we're going to talk about attaching something to it. Remember, anytime I attach something to or detach something from an enzyme, the enzyme changes shape and that impacts its ability to perform its reaction. In this case, let's talk about two types of inhibition, two different ways in which we can inactivate an enzyme. The first one is called competitive inhibition. Now you remember that enzymes have an active binding site to them. Okay, uh, let's say, let's draw an enzyme here. And let's say that there's its active binding site. If I take a molecule that is not the one that the enzyme supports supposed to perform the job on, and it happens to have a similar enough shape that it can fit into that active binding site, what I've literally just done then is plug up that active binding site so no substrate can get in there. What I've just done is competitively inhibit that enzyme. I've outcompeted the substrate to bind at the active binding site. Another type of in enzyme inhibition is non-competitive inhibition. And non-competitive inhibition, uh, what happens is, let's say I've got my enzyme here again, something like that, and it has its, uh, the primary active binding site is right here in yellow, and it also has another region of the enzyme that's shaped to accept a molecule. If I take an inhibitor that's shaped properly to go into this site, and place it in there, what happens when I attach anything to an enzyme? Well, it changes shape and suddenly what had been um, a properly shaped binding site suddenly changes into something that isn't properly shaped anymore to accept this reactant here. That's called non-competitive inhibition. I'm not out competing the substrate at the active binding site, but what I'm doing is attaching to the enzyme in some other location, causing the enzyme to change shape and the substrate to no longer bind to the active binding site. The third way that I can inhibit an enzyme is an interesting one and it's a common one we see in the body. It's called feedback inhibition. Now imagine I've got a metabolic pathway like I have here where I start out with uh, substrate A and that substrate A is converted to substrate B by enzyme number two, it's converted to substrate C by enzyme number three, it's converted to D by enzyme number four, and it's converted to E by enzyme number five until we get our final end product. Okay, That's a metabolic pathway, we discussed those earlier. What if the end product had the ability to bind to or non-competitively inhibit to bind to another region of the enzyme just like we had down here, that would cause the enzyme to change shape in its active binding region and now the first reactant, reactant A, no longer fits in the site like it used to. This is a really um, effective way. You're, you're basically inhibiting the first um, reactant in the sequence so that you don't overproduce the product basically. Uh, your body uses this all the time. If its job is to manure, if a cell's job is to manufacture a particular product for use in the cell and there's enough of that product around, there's no reason to expend additional energy making more of the product if you don't need any more. So a great way to limit how much product you make is to have the product inhibit through the start of the metabolic pathway once the end product is in high enough concentration to do so. 
Hope that makes sense. Uh, la last part of the lecture we're going to be talking about is oxidative reduction reactions. See you there.